center hmm? there is a saying in south india it says doesn't matter who pounds the rice as long as i get the rice it's fine it's a village a country proverb that means you don't have to worry about who is the pounder there is a male female black white brown young old short tall it doesn't matter all i am interested in is having a little rice pounded well i think that is the motto for the wellness center also it doesn't matter what approach you take what pathi you use or what path you use as long as the person gets well that's well last year we had a wonderful gathering in bangalore i think mala also was there about 30 40 different pathis huh? came together and uh, when they asked me to say a few words i said that it's good to have all the pathis but more than any pathi you know what i mean by pati eh? allopathy homeopathy naturopathy eh? namopathy eh? mm-hmm. yogopathy eh? mm-hmm. apart from all the pathis the one important pathi the practitioner should have and that's what you call sympathy mm-hmm. if the patient if the doctor has real sympathy over the patient that itself goes a long way in bringing health and happiness to the patient there was another saying called marand marandu paadi maruttuvan paadi half by medicine half by the doctor it's not just the medicine alone it is your attitude your approach your sympathy your concern your compassion your love to the patient that's where in a way yoga and meditation comes in because the essential point behind yoga is to see your own self in other beings not only in other persons in other beings you are treating yourself as the great scriptures say do unto others what you would want to be done to yourself and you cannot do it unless you see your own self in the patient that brings a beautiful rapport a good communication and then all the rest happens naturally that is the essence behind yoga see the oneness of all in spirit 
to yuj, to unite, to yoke, is yoga. And of course, there are many levels are many helpful practices to achieve this, such as uh, keeping a clean mind, clean body through yoga practices, asana practices, which is called hatha yoga, pranayama, breathing techniques, and then a little discipline over the senses and through the senses the mind and to waste more or less the the final climax of the practice is what you call meditation yoga is arranged in eight steps yama niyama asana pranayama pratyahara dharana there are six then comes dhyana, the meditation. So meditation becomes more easy if a person follows the rest of the, the preparations also. So we should not just meditation, means simply think of something. You have to prepare your mind, prepare your body to think of it. And of course, the modern medical field is very well aware of the importance of thought. As you think, so you become. So the practitioner's first and foremost duty, in a way, if I could say it's a duty, is to give that hope to the patient no matter how worse the condition is. There seems to be a modern thinking that, oh, you have to tell them clearly what the problem is and scare them as much as possible. <laughs> no. Even if it is really a scary situation, even if it's going to die next minute, give them hope. Oh, anything can happen. Miracles can happen. The whole thing will get changed. Don't worry. Give, don't give up hope. Hope is the best medicine. Hope is the best medicine. If a person gives up that hope, even if you bring nectar, it won't work. It becomes a hopeless case then. So never to let the patient lose the hope. Let him be confident in that. Because there were stories. When all the doctors give up the case and say, even pronounce that he is dead clinically. I don't know what you mean by clinically dying and real dying. And the body is taken into that special room ready to be packed up. And then after half an hour or one hour, when the relatives come, when they go in to see the body, the body wakes up and walks out. <laughs> we have seen cases like that. Totally given up, they revive. So at what point you give up hope? Even if you leave the body, don't give up hope. Why? Because you have a better body waiting for you. So the hope, hope, hope is the best pati, best medicine. And that is the keynote in yoga too, in meditation. Think, think, think well. Think Positively, meditation means that you think deeply. Whatever you think, you will become. Reminds me of one of the 
greatest work, ethical work in South India, written by a saintly person, Thiruvalluvar. He positively proclaims that Ennir Enyangu Eiduvar, Ennir Thinnir Agapirin. A person can exactly get whatever he wants if only he thinks deeply. Ennir Thinnir totally convincingly. Because the mind has that kind of tremendous power. If a person can have that kind of positive mind, there's nothing he cannot achieve in this world. Not only health, happiness, wealth, everything, social comfort, all we can get whatever we want, if we have that positive thinking. Meditation is based on that. But as I said before, even to coordinate, collect the mind, and to think deeply with the total energy of the mind, we had to plan prepare the mind because it's very hard to put all the mind together. The mind likes to run here and there. All the great sages and saints have unanimously agreed in this, that the mind is the worst monkey. And that too, not just a plain monkey, a drunkard monkey. And not only just a drunkard monkey, drunkard but bitten by a scorpion. <laughs> Imagine, yeah? I'm just quoting what they have said. <laughs> so you see how much of an energy you have to, how much of a planning, preparation to put the mind together, coax it slowly, slowly, slowly. That is the reason why all these steps just take care of your daily life a little. Don't be too greedy. Don't be too average. <laughs> Running around here and there wanting to get this and that <laughs> and doing nothing. <laughs> Calm down a little. Calm down. <laughs> Use a little devotional approach. Well, God is there. My father and mother. <laughs> Certainly he knows what I need. Father knows the best, is it not? <laughs> he knows what I need, what I deserve. And certainly, even without my asking, he is going to give me. Use God for this purpose. Huh? But don't worry whether there is a God or not, you can use it comfortably for this, just to bring comfort to your. Because there is lot, always a question, is there a God? Where is that? Is he a he or a she? All that problem. Huh? It doesn't matter. Huh? Where there is a God or not, simply create a God, use it. Don't we do, do that in our uh, uh, maths and uh, algebra, for example? You just bring an unwanted X there. <laughs> Suppose the answer is X. You don't even know what an X is, but you just bring it there and then work with that unknown, undesirable, unwanted X. And then when you get the answer, X is so, so much, X is equal to 8 or 10, then you got the answer, what do you do with the X? Exit. <laughs> because there's an extra. <laughs> so keep up the X until you get the answer. When you got the answer, blow it out. Maybe God is also like that. If you don't feel comfortable with the God, use God as an X for a while. 
if you can get something, then say, okay, bye-bye, God. I got whatever I want. I don't need you anymore. I'll call you when I need you. See, it's all based on this. To make use of something, some hold, some excuse to make the mind a little more calm, a little more balanced. That is another term very often used in yoga. Balance, equanimity, tranquility, samatvam yoga ujjyate. Equanimity is yoga. Always keep the mind balanced. Use any excuse to find the balance. Use your own capacity, intelligence, or use somebody's words, or use God's name. It doesn't matter how you, as I said earlier, who pounds, doesn't matter, get the rice. So, mind should be calmed. That is another important thing to note in the name of yoga. It is to calm the mind. That is the goal of yoga. And that's the goal of meditation also. Not really go and achieve something here and there. Once you calm the mind, then you achieve everything. Without calming the mind, if you want to achieve something, you cannot. Is there not a beautiful saying in the Bible? Seek that kingdom, first and foremost. Then what happens when you get that? All the rest will be simply thrown into, <laughs> added unto. Whether you want it or not, he'll just come on. You got the most important thing. All the rest is nothing. Just take it. Go. Wealth, health, friends, money, name, fame. This is all secondary things. Just byproducts. Take it. Go. Because you got the first and foremost thing, the kingdom of of God. And what is that kingdom of God? Where is it? Is God sitting in a throne somewhere, on a throne? Somewhere up in the heaven? We always, our Father in the heaven. And the same scriptures say kingdom is within you. So in you is the kingdom. As what? Yoga explains has a peaceful mind. Let the mind be peaceful, it becomes a beautiful throne for that divine light, divine energy to express itself. So yoga and meditation, they are not two different things, one and the same. Is practiced with this goal in mind to calm the mind. And then why it begins with yama niyama, cleaning the mind? Because you can never calm the mind without cleaning it first. It's almost like you can never drive a car without tuning it up well. Clean the mind. That means anything that would disturb the mind Keep it out. Cleaning mind is that's what. Anything, any thought, any action that would disturb your mind, stay away from it. Then the mind gets into its natural, pure, calm state. So it's not uh, the question here is how to calm the mind. Instead, how to stay away from disturbing the mind. If let, left alone, it is peaceful. It's almost like a bowl of water. You don't have to make the water do something to calm the water. Don't shake it. Don't put your hand into it. Don't throw something into it. Leave it. It finds its own natural tranquility. Mind is exactly like that. That's why 
the yama niyama, which is very similar to the commandments in Judaism or Christianity. They say, do not do this, do not do that, do not. Why? If you do that, your mind will be disturbed. Your life will get disturbed and you will be disturbing others also. So, if you stay away from doing all these things that would disturb your mind, your mind finds its balance. That's why the ethical part comes in. It's in life. Yoga is something that you live, not just go in a corner of the room, half a day you practice yoga, and then say, oh, I'm a yogi for half a day. Um, or half an hour. <laughs> then, the rest of the hours, you are a rogi. Hmm? The Sanskrit word roga means opposite to yoga. <laughs> Rogam means disease, <laughs> disturbed condition. <laughs> That's why there is a beautiful word for health in Sanskrit, arogyam. <laughs> that means free from roga, free from disturbance. So anything, it's not necessarily some of the practices you term as yoga practices. Every minute you practice yoga. When you eat, when you talk, when you sleep, when you walk, continuous, constant practice of yoga. That means Keep this in mind. All my thoughts and all my actions should be based on not disturbing my mind. And of course, it's not easy to do something directly with the mind. So we begin the work with a gross, concrete mind. What is concrete mind? The body. We should not forget that. Body is nothing but a solidified mind. Mind is a subtle thing. That's why if anything happens to the body, the mind gets affected or vice versa. You think happily, your body expresses the joy. You think some sad things, the body reflects it. That means every thought has, to, did, has done something to the body. That means body is not something totally different. So we, though we say mind and body, mind and body, to me, mind and body are one and the same. If you have done something to one, you have done something to the other also. Actually, it is your mind that even created you, the body. You want it. The mind had certain thought forms, certain desires to experience. And so it built a body conducive to that. So your body is created by you, that means by your mind. Of course, in the Hindu term, is your karma. Karma is nothing but the sum total of your thoughts, past thoughts, desires. Change the thoughts, you change the body. So. That is the reason why it's very difficult to go and do something directly with the mind because it's very subtle. So you begin with the concrete mind, which is more physical, more touchable. That's where the asana comes in, little physical practices. And then the real link between the concrete mind, the body, and the subtle mind. The mind is the in-between, the prana, the breath. So, next part comes as regulating the breath, calming the breath. We can normally see 
if all of a sudden our mind gets agitated our breath gets agitated right away without even you are wanting it you breathe heavily if somebody says a sort of a word that you don't like very much and say oh, how, how dare you see you breathe heavily see immediately make use of that clue and to calm the mind calm the breath and that's what slow alternate breathing comes in any time we get agitated we can immediately begin to do some slow deep breathing we can use it very well in our therapy in our practice no matter what approaches you have we should not forget the patient is breathing <laughs> huh? so you can always advise the patient breathe slowly breathe deeply huh? you don't have to write a prescription for it <laughs> and remember every deep breath puts in lot of vitality prana we call it in sanskrit vital energy comes directly from the breath from the air that we breathe in every breath puts new energy into and you imagine if it is a long and deep breath that much of energy goes in your whole body gets oxygenated if i could use that term we need lot of oxygen to burn up the poisons inside and to throw it out burnt you don't have to worry about all these eh, minute invisible eh, beings which you call viruses sometimes i laugh at people they say a superior creation <laughs> they are so mortally afraid of this little unseen viruses and say oh flu 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 i don't know where you are going to fly <laughs> you know the name of flu the full name influenza i always make a joke out of it So if you have influenza that means the virus has influenced you you are under the influence of this minute creatures <laughs> why because they are strong you are weak otherwise you cannot be influenced turn the table you become stronger than them they cannot influence you instead you can influence them it's very simple immunity and that comes from a deep breath even the the the, the worst problem that we face the aids what is it i don't know who uh, invented that name is very correct it says acquired immunity deficiency syndrome acquired immunity deficiency that means you have acquired the deficiency of immunity why it's not that you acquired the deficiency you lost lot of immunity and it has become deficient you have wasted lot of vital energy lot of prana how by your wrong lifestyles in every way over indulging in anything over eating over talking over sleeping everything over beyond the limit there is a moderation in everything if we go over anything it drains our energy 
So and we call that uh, enjoyment in life. I don't know what you call enjoyment in life. Even scratching the itch is enjoyment. The minute you take the hands off, it burns. If you scratch too much, it bleeds. Is that what we call enjoyment? No. Enjoyment means without any sorrow, without any problems, all the way, continuous. It's not temporary enjoyment. So in the name of temporary enjoyment, a little fun, we go and waste a lot of our energy. The patients should be informed of these things. In a way, I always advise my doctor friends, if a patient comes to you, you just find out what the problem is and try to explain the patient how he or she got into this situation. What did he do in life? Smoking, drinking, undesirable food, junk food, that leaves a lot of toxins in the system. Explain them. These are the cause. Thiruvallavar says, noi nadi, noi mudal nadi. That means look for the disease and look for the cause of the disease. And then explain it to them. Let them be convinced, oh yes, these are all the things I did. That's why I'm in this trouble. Then are you ready to at least Slowly stay away from those things. If the patient says, oh, I cannot give, I give up my smoking, you can give me a prick on this hand, all while I smoke here. You are wasting your time and his time. And even the money that he will be spending will be a waste. The doctors should keep that in mind. Try to explain and ask the patient, convince the patient to stay away from that. Prevention is better than cure. Once if they agree, yes, I will try to give up, not immediately, but at least try my best to give up, then it's better you do some therapy do some cleaning, curing job. Otherwise, you put cleaning and he continues to pollute. Like my good friend Dean Ornish used to say always, you mop up the floor, still allow the facet to run. The water tap is not closed. The water overflows in the sink, fills up the floor, and then you keep on mopping without closing the valve. What good of it? If any doctor does it, it means doctor is not interested in curing the patient. They're interested in not only feeling the pulse, but feel the pulse also. So that's my advice to the doctors. Before even you feel the pulse, don't look into the pulse. I'm just quoting an old saying. Kaitadu Patruman, Paitadu Patri. An old poet said that. Before he, Kaitadu, the pulse, Paitadu, the, the energy in the pocket. That's why I said a sympathetic practitioner will not look into the purse first. That's a secondary. The greatest reward for you is the joy of having done something, helped something to the person. Then automatically, there is a, a, a cosmic uh, computer there. It knows how to tally. If you have really done something good, you will be sent reward, either directly from this guy or somebody else will give you something. In India, there is again a saying, doctors and teachers should not work for money. Yes. If money becomes the first main criteria, 
teaching is no teaching and treating is no treating. You think of the person. Often we eliminate that son. Purse, that's all. Not purse, person, purse. That's not yoga. I don't know what you are expecting me to tell you. Because my yoga is not just reading a book or following the letter, following the spirit. Is there anything I should add on, Mala? Hmm. Hmm? Have I confused them enough? Huh? Ah. Well, if not, we can turn on a few more lights. Huh? Hmm? Hmm? Enlightening. Hmm? Is there any any questions? I don't mind answering a few from the not from the ashramites. They always have doubts. That's why they are here. <laughs> and, and if they have they have no doubt, they won't be here anyway. So they have a lot of opportunity to ask. But the, our today's guests should be given the preference. Silence is golden. Hmm? Hmm? Good, good, good. So, is there anything particular that I missed or you want me to talk about? I may add a, a little. Hmm? Maybe you could talk a little bit about the kriyas and how they're helpful. Kriya. Ah, ah, good, 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 good. See, that's what, huh? Sudarvila kainum thundhul vendum. Even if it is a, 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 a bright, shining light, you know, in those days the light is with oil and wick. Even if it is burning well, we need a small stick to push it up a little so it can shine bright. So, Mala is really pushing me up a little. Good. Kriya is actually cleansing processes mostly, according to the Hatha Yoga. I was touching the point of how the system gets polluted by our wrongdoings. Mainly things that go in, the water, the drink that we drink, should I say drink? Because here the connotation for drink is something always different, no? Comes out of bottle. Eh? <laughs> eh? Because you cannot say, did you have your drink? <laughs> have a drink? <laughs> they don't immediately think it's water. <laughs> eh? Well, anyway, any liquid that goes in, <laughs> if it is not clean, any air that goes in, it's not clean, any food that goes in, it's not clean. Remember, when I say clean, 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 not only uh, analytically, in, in the lab it is clean. Like a doctor certifies it's a healthy animal. So it's a clean animal. But that's not what I mean by cleaning. It's not completely clean. Does it bring good vibrations. Yeah. Is it the product of love? Is it given to you lovingly? 
even a mother in a sort of bad mood if she nurses the baby the baby falls sick because along with the milk her vibrations get passed through so can the animals give you happily come on take my thigh make super feet no so the food if it comes with bad vibrations that gets polluted even though the doctor says it's it's clean animal healthy animal it's not really healthy animal so the food should bring good vibrations also so when by eating food without considering all these things we put lot of accumulate lot of toxins physical food toxins mental food sins <laughs> one is sin another is toxin <laughs> the same so how to clean it elimination is important that's where the kriya comes in you have to burn it out you have to throw it out you may have prevented from further coming in but how do you remove it dauti vasti vastrika that means cleaning the colon the large intestines cleaning the stomach probably it's simple drink a half a gallon of water little by little not all of a sudden and then do a little movement of the stomach like you pour water into the bottle shake it and then pour it out and then throw it out of course the in the western approach they insert a long rubber tube into the alimentary canal until it reaches the stomach and then leave the rest down so by siphon system it comes out but that's not really that comfortable the simple way is just have a few glasses of water shake the stomach simply move it like this pump it up or just move it this way forward backward and then take a little salt with the wet finger just touch the salt put it against the throat take a little everything comes out if you feel embarrassed do it quietly in your bathroom not in front of others but here we teach them in front of others so that's cleaning the stomach of course the cleaning large intestine the colon is simple like an enema recently somebody sent me a nice book from india written in south indian language all about enema 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 for everything is talks about an enema it's true in fact somebody came with a, an inflamed a uh, uh, swell uh, i mean swelled eye he couldn't even see i said come on come into the room give him an enema for what i come with an eye problem you are asking me to take an enema yes sir your eye has to be purged out first <laughs> fever an enema cold enema everything because that is where the manufactory of the problem toxins so but of course in the yogic way in terms of enema they small insert a small tube and suck the air in with water when you sit in the water you don't have to go to that extent just an enema will be enough throwing out and bastrika with vigorous breathing you put lot of oxygen in and you burn it out you clean the mucus anybody who has 
fever, I mean hay fever, practicum bastrika. You will just simply say, hey, fever, go, finished. Yeah. Yeah. Very simple. Nasal blockage. And uh, of course, some eye exercises. Tratak is on one of the kriyas. Hmm? Eliminating even the pranayama itself will help a lot. Hmm? People who have problems in even giving up certain habits which they call, oh, I am addicted to this, addicted to that, huh? overeating, drinking, or smoking. If you have an addiction problem, it's mainly caused by the toxins that has already found home in your system. Unless all that is eliminated, huh? you will continue to have the addiction. So burn it out. For that, pranayama is the best. Deep breathing, vigorous breathing, you literally burn it out. And more subtle approach is, I don't know how much you would like that, chanting. Chanting is an enchanting practice. You are using sound vibrations, mantra vibrations. Sound vibrations can burn it out. Now, a few days back, I even saw they are trying to bring it back again, some of the cleaning processes through sounds. Ultrasonic. You know, we can clean jewels and watches with sound alone. Because that has tremendous power. It can completely clean it out. It can penetrate to every cell your sound energy and clean it out. That's why the chanting is. And that's what you call prayer. Of course, prayer is not just only thinking or saying. It should be done well to bring out. That's the reason why we even give mantras. Mantras are certain phrases. which has tremendous energy. Each letter can do something specially on your body. We call it Bijakshara, or the seed letters. It can create heat if you want. It, it can cool your system. It can burn your mucus. It can take care of the wind problems. There is Agni Bija, Vayu Bija, Varuna Bija. So these are all using the sound vibrations. Just take for example, if you feel a little cold. This is the winter season. How would you keep yourself warm with a mantra? Would you like a mantra to keep yourself warm? Have some rum. <laughs> Immediately you think, Swami asking us to take some rum? See, the name rum was given to it because it brings similar experience, similar energy like that of the Bijakshara Ram. Ram is a Bijakshara. The name Rama is rooted in Ram. Simply say Ram, 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 Ram. You will see tremendous heat coming into the system. Oh yes. Yam, Lam, Ram, Vam, Sham. These are all the five elements. Bija Aksharas for five elements. Huh? Ram Bija is, that's why Ram, 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 Rama is Ram included into that. Huh? It can fight off all the problems. 
That's why they use rum a lot <laughs> to fight. <laughs> of course, in the war, they use rum and drum. <laughs> so the, I'm talking about the power of the mantras, power of the syllables. That's also part of Kriya. So all these Kriyas are mainly practiced to eliminate, to throw out. Once the toxins are eliminated, you won't have the craving. Take, for example, smoking. The nicotine that has found home in your body, even if you don't want to smoke, the, the nicotine that is already in wants more nicotine. That's what you call craving. You don't want it. At the same time, something is wanting it in you. And what is that something that wants more nicotine? The nicotine that is already in your home. So, how to stop that? Throw it out. Eliminate that nicotine, you will never have problems. Otherwise, you are addicted. You want it more and more. That's why many people fail in stopping habits like drinking and smoking because they don't clean out what is accumulated already in. And they try to find some substitutes long before, some 15 years back, uh, the drug rehabilitation program people from Washington approached me and I even told them, I say, you are, oh, what is that uh, for, they give another met method, methadone, methadone, huh? they give methadone, huh? a substitute, huh? then people get addicted to that, that's another form of poison. Huh? Instead, simple yoga practice, change the diet, huh? do a lot of pranayama, Clean your pure body. You don't have to have any substitute. And then we will think over it. And then they went back and they never called me. I said, fine, leave it. But that was 15 years back. Now it's coming again. Thanks to some of the crazy doctors who wanted to prove that yoga, meditation, Diet can help. In that respect, I salute my good friend, Dr. Anish. He has really achieved and proved to the world. Just by changing the diet, by meditation, by proper visualization, you can heal the heart. Now, it will be surprising for you to know that India wants him to go and tell tell them about yoga and meditation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>